Hello, everyone. I'm Pastor Paul Thompson here at West St. Olaf Lutheran Church and East St. Olaf Lutheran Church, and I welcome you to a time of worship and devotions with one another. Um, the uh, lessons are, that we're reading for this day are from the Sunday of Trinity, the day when we celebrate God's nature as three in one and one in three. May that blessed one in three God be with you all as you watch this. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty Creator and ever-living God, we worship your glory, eternal three in one, and we praise your power, majestic one in three. Keep us steadfast in this faith, defend us in all adversity, and bring us at last into your presence, where you live in endless joy and love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Reading from the 13th chapter of the book of 2 Corinthians, where Paul writes, Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with the holy kiss, all the saints greet you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. And then, reading from the 20th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go there and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you to the end of the age. Thus ends our readings. We'll continue with the hymn, Come Thou Almighty King. Dear friends, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as you can tell from the first two readings, talking about the Holy Trinity, we confess that God is one, that there is only one God. The Israels learned that from Moses. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Muslims confess this truth as well, but we Christians say that God is also three. God is three persons, distinct and yet unified. 
God is three in one, and at the same time, God is one in three. It's a puzzle, a mystery. To many people, it sounds like nonsense, especially to Jews and to Muslims, but it is a truth that we have been uh, teaching for many years, revealed to us in our scriptures. The fact that God is one is something that we can indeed celebrate with Jews and Muslims, and in recent years that has begun to happen. But at the same time, we continue to believe, teach, and confess that the one God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is unity even in distinction. There is oneness even in threeness. And even though there are three persons in God, there is no division within God. It is a unity. It is a oneness. And in that truth, we rejoice. Now, people are divided. We are distinct. We are divided into nations. We are divided into ethnicities or nationalities. We are divided into classes. We are divided into religious faiths. We are divided into political parties. We call ourselves one, but we do not act like one. Not always, anyway. There's division all over our nation right now. Our motto, e pluribus unum, Latin for of many, one, is not the reality we see playing out before us. We are many, and we've always been many. The first people over here were nomads from Asia, crossing the Bering Strait land bridge tens of thousands of years ago. But then the English came, and then they brought Africans here in chains. Then the Germans came, and then the Irish, and Jews from all over Europe, Scandinavians, then Chinese, then Latin Americans, and then Poles, and Hungarians, and Italians, and Russians, and so on, and so on, and so on. Our fathers, the founding fathers, after gaining independence, set up our nation to be a place where all are equal in privilege, and all have equal rights and equal opportunity. But we have struggled, oftentimes unsuccessfully, to keep that. In the 1860s, we came this close to being permanently separated, but we stayed together. We were many, but we were one. But now it's gotten to the point where we can't even talk meaningfully about the things that divide us. And if we can't talk about things, how can we begin to bridge our differences? If I denounce one police officer for brutality, people will accuse me then of uh, denouncing all police in general, which I do not mean to do. And if I support protesters who are acting peacefully and respectfully, but I'm accused of agreeing with those who act violently and do terrible things. These days, if you agree with one side, you have to automatically be utterly opposed to the other sides. If you uh, think that there should be a few regulations on guns, then automatically people assume you're against all guns. And if you support the rights of gun ownership, then people think they automatically have to oppose any kind of regulation, reasonable or otherwise, no matter how small. Everything you say is controversial. Today we are under more divided than any time in my life, certainly, and I think more divided than any time since our Civil War. We are free to speak, but that also means we are free to listen. And too often we listen only to people who already share our points of views and opinions. We have equal rights, but some folks' rights are respected more than others. We talk about equal opportunity, but in our honest moments, we know that the wealthy have more opportunities than the middle class, and the middle class has more opportunities than the lower class. And those differences can be toxic, just as toxic as our differences in race. White people in general, I don't think, understand how much being white gives them privilege that people of color lack. Jasmine Cho defines white privilege she makes cookie portraits of Asian American figures so that people can understand more about Asian American history and the importance that they have been to the building up of our nation. She says, white privilege is when your culture is taught as core curriculum, but mine is taught as an elective. White privilege is why there's a Black History Month and why there's no White History Month, because 
all the rest of the year is white history month all the time. White privilege is why most white people are not terribly afraid of the police. I've never had a negative uh, interaction with a police officer. We are less likely to get pulled over, less likely to be asked to step out of the car, less likely to be arrested than persons of color are. And that's just the reality. Statistics show that at three o'clock in the morning, black drivers are more than twice as likely than white drivers to be pulled over. That's pulled over in the case of a, a driving, active driving violation like speeding or rolling through a stop sign or stop light or what have you. That's at three in the morning when it's dark. At 2 p.m., when in the daylight officers can better identify who is driving a vehicle, black drivers or drivers of color are nine times more likely to be arrested for low-level offenses. Nine times. I repeat, nine times. And that's fact. That is statistical fact that you can see from the records. And that's what feeds so much anger within the African-American community. It doesn't excuse violence. It doesn't excuse destruction. But it's kind of where the anger originates. A presenter at our last Senate Theological Conference, Okon Udo, told us of his experience of being black in America. He was driving through Prior Lake, outside the cities there, and he had car trouble. So he pulled over and called AAA. And while he was waiting for uh, help to arrive, a police car pulled up behind him with its lights flashing. Well, Okon, Okon knew the drill. He turned on the dome light of his car and put his hands firmly on the wheel at the 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock positions and he waited for the officer to walk up. When the officer asked what he was doing, Okokon explained the situation and that he was just waiting for help to get there from AAA. The officer said, I'm not gonna wait long for you to move on. If you don't get this moving fast, I'll have it towed. So Okokon called AAA again and explained the urgency of the situation, and he made sure to put his phone on speaker so the police officer could hear both sides of the conversation and realize that he was there legitimately waiting for a tow truck. When the call was over, the police officer, police officer still said, if you don't move this car in five minutes, I'm going to have it towed. Fortunately for him, AAA got there first. He says he's been pulled over seven times while driving in predominantly white neighborhoods with not having committed a single illegal act. White privilege is real. And the only people who can really fix white privilege is white people. We who get the benefit of the doubt from the authorities are the ones who need to see it, that the authorities give that same benefit of the doubt to our fellow citizens. We who can count on police for protection have to stick up for people who are often targeted by police. It isn't rules and laws. It isn't force and threats. It isn't treats and pronouncements and cynical photo ops in front of churches. It's white people recognizing, calling out, and refusing to stand by when injustice, unfairness, inequality, and discrimination are happening in front of them. It's you and me taking the risk of acting on behalf of those who are different from ourselves. Now, it seems since I've been here in these three and a half years that I've been talking a lot about division and disunity in our world around us, and I know full well my one voice isn't going to solve this problem. But I want us to continually realize and take seriously that we are divided. It's my job as pastor to call that out. I have to call evil evil when I see it, and division is evil. Racism is evil. Sexism is evil. Any kind of discrimination based on who a person looks like, is evil. I bet any one of us could sit down with any random person from around the world and find something in common with them, beyond just the fact that we're human, that we all breathe and sleep and are vulnerable to viruses. We can find something in common with anybody anywhere, but we would inevitably find differences. And that is okay. Our differences, when we come together, make us stronger. Somebody who's better than we are at something can do that thing for the good of all. Our differences make us more capable of dealing with the world with our very real challenges all around us. Our differences don't make any one of us any less human than any other of us. 
And sometimes it doesn't take big things to make big changes happen. At the House of Peak and Reconciliation in Medellin, Colombia, Lutherans are striving to bring peace to a community that has been torn by conflict for many years. The House of Peace and Reconciliation was founded by Mission Luterana Emmaus, which is a mission start of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Colombia. And the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Colombia is a mission partner to the Southeastern Minnesota Synod of the ELCA. And the House of Peace and Reconciliation focuses on equipping people in the area where it's located, something called Comuna 13, to resolve conflicts peacefully. They receive grants from our ELCA to support this work through our mission support. One of the things that the money that we send from ourselves onto the Synod is able to accomplish. One of the things that makes our gifts so important and so necessary. Well, the civil war that has driven Colombia apart since 1964 has left 600,000 people either dead or displaced. And that's nearly one out of 10 people in Colombia. And the former combatants need to be reintegrated into everyday life. Pastor John Hernandez of Emmaus a Lutheran Mission there says, our vision is not only to preach the gospel, but to live the gospel in our community. The gospel gives us a special language to talk not only about peace, but also talk about reconciliation. Generally, in Communa 13, the need is to learn to coexist, to accept those who think differently. They host a peace and reconciliation program that attracted 25 students from Communa 13 and from other faith communities and from other human rights groups to a peace-focused organization there in Medellin. The students were committed to replicating at least some of what they learned from their respective communities and from their respective organizations. They started up a theater group that uses drama as a creative tool to help people process their experiences, things that they'd experienced during all those years of civil war. And they hope to send the message that we can abandon the presumption of scarcity and begin to trust the abundance of resources around us. With the blessings of God, with the grace of God, with the love of God, we can come together, as different as we may be. We can never just write each other off. We can never just forget what the other person's saying, block them out, and refuse to listen to them. We can listen, and we can speak. And we can make sure the good news of Jesus Christ, the good news of God the Father who made us all, who made every single one of us as different as we may be, the message of the Holy Spirit who binds us together, who calls us and gathers us, we can share that message with all people. Through St. Paul, God tells us, put things in order, listen to my appeal, agree with one another, live in in peace. Paul left that troubled, divided, squabbling congregation there in Corinth with the same words that I began our worship with earlier at the beginning of this video. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. God is one. God calls us to be one. Let us be one. Let us not write each other off. Let us not ignore each other. Let us not forget each other. Let us love each other. Amen. Now may the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The next hymn we sing is... Holy, holy, holy.
continue then with the responsive prayers of the church. Each petition will end with, Hear us, O God. I ask you to respond, if you wish, with, Your mercy is great. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. God of community, you form us as your church. Guide our bishops, pastors, and deacons, and all the baptized in sharing your life-giving good news with all the world. Strengthen us to be bold in our proclamation. Hear us, O God. Your yeah. mercy is great. God of creation, you called everything into being. Sustain this world with your renewing care. Inspire us to see waterways, plant life, birds, fish, mammals, and all living things, and call them good. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of counsel, all authority belongs to you. Encourage the leaders of this and every land to seek peace, equality, and unity. Teach us to love one another, that there can be justice for no one until there is justice for all. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of care, you created us in your image. Help us to see your likeness in one another, whatever race, ethnicity, or national origin. Open our eyes to see and attend to all who face oppression and suffering. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of companionship. You accompany this body of faith. As the rhythms of summer begin, protect all who travel and renew all who will enjoy a time of Sabbath and shelter all who will not be protected from the sun's heat. Bless also those who are gathering for all kinds of occasions, especially the family and friends of Boyd and Gloria as they celebrate their 65th anniversary. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of compassion. You comfort us in our grief with the promise of resurrection. Console, heal, and nourish all in need, especially Orly, Bill, Diane, Laura, Steve, Marianne, Royce, Ashley, Sylvia, Dawn, Paula, Emily, Viola, Steve, Julie, Heidi, Dale, David, Sally, Carol, Peggy, John, Kurt, Kelly, Boyd, Bill, Joanne L., Joanne T., Robert, Philip, Matt, and Dave. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue with the Lord's Prayer, and you may join as you wish. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you now and always. Amen. This has been Pastor Paul Thompson asking God's blessings on you every day.